Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited about our conversation this evening. Um, uh, the roundtable, making the case for business, and, uh, sorry, not making the case for business anthropology, um, um, business anthropology after the pandemic, applying what we've learned. Um, uh, just a quick note, our conversation today will be recorded. Um, um, you'll be able to view it um, at a later date on bizanthro.com. And we're really thrilled that you're all joining us uh, for tonight's event. Those of you who are local to New York City may know that the Business Anthropology Salon um, got its start as a local initiative. Uh, we began organizing events roughly two years ago with the goal of bringing together working anthropologists who work across the private sector largely in the New York City tri-state area for in-person events, just like this virtual one now. Um, and these events have been organized by myself, Julia Gr uh, Greenberg, as well as my two wonderful co-organizers, Matt Arts and Robert Morais. Uh, like many of you who are joining us today, I have um, kind of interdisciplinary blended background. I started my career in business as a brand strategist, working in advertising agencies, big and small. Uh, and while strategists are often, um, are often viewed as the voice of the consumer, I also recognized at that time that I really needed a stronger understanding of the different ways that people live and organize their lives. So with that goal in mind, I ultimately earned a PhD in cultural anthropology from Columbia University. And today I'm fortunate that I'm able to kind of bridge these two, uh, two trajectories into one. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology and business at Drew University in New Jersey. Uh, and I like to say that I, my, my role at Drew is to help anthropology students really learn more about business and to help business students um, um, learn more about anthropological methods and anthropological theory. And Matt Arts will be our moderator for tonight's panel. Similarly, blends anthropology and business having earned both in the main anthropology and MBA. Today, Matt is head of, head of product and experience at Cloud Shading uh, Consulting. Um, he's also the founder and career coach at Anthro to UX, and he has a wonderful set of UX. Um, uh, uh, he's got a host of podcasts that you can also check out on his website. And Robert Morais is um, our, our core organizer and resident sage, as I like to think of him. Um, he entered the advertising world after earning his PhD in cultural anthropology as well. And he's built a career um, as, a, as an advertising executive, as a marketing researcher, as an ethnographer. And today he teaches qualitative research methods at Columbia Business School. Um, so uh, I'm re we're really glad that we're able to um, take the conversations we are kind of familiar with um, hosting in a small, on a smaller scale locally, virtually, uh, and that um, uh, really meant an opportunity to engage with a larger community of anthropologists uh, working across the private sector, um, across industries, as well as across countries. Um, in December, we hosted our first virtual panel, a format which also made it possible for us to connect, as I said, with our larger community, and we're excited to uh, continue this initiative today uh, with our second round table um, focused on lessons learned uh, during the pandemic. Uh, whether we meet in person, which we hope to be able to do soon as well, or continue to get online, really our intention as a um, salon is to bring together people who are working on uh, thinking alongside anthropology and business, um, to share experiences, to discuss problems to conceptualize future directions for anthropology and business. Um, and to also really hope to raise the visibility of anthropology uh, in the professional sphere, whether we're identified as anthropologists or, or simply um, use anthropology to ins inspire our practice. Um, so uh, I just wanna uh, say that with this in mind, uh, the, the pandemic really has made it clear over the last year that anthropological thinking is probably more uh, necessary in the workplace than ever, really at every level of professional endeavor, regardless of where one sits in the organization. So we are approaching today's round panel with that kind of mind frame in mind as well. Um, at the same time, we also recognize that the pandemic has left an impact on our personal lives, on our professional lives, 
Um, we recognize that it's far from over um, and that many countries around the world are still facing an uphill battle, of course, um, to control rising level of infections and uh, kind of really still in the throes of dealing with this crisis. And I, in, in the midst of this crisis, our, our hope is that our panel also kind of focuses a critical lens, but a caution, cautiously optimistic lens on the future um, as we reflect on the way the pandemic has altered the nature of business as well as our work lives. Uh, we convene today's uh, discussion with today's panelists to recognize lessons learned over the past year of uh, working through the pandemic that we may carry into our future work as anthropologists in the, in the business world, broadly speaking. Um, so I'll briefly introduce our participants and I'll then I'll hand this over, things over to Matt, um, who will moderate our conversation today. So I'm ex um, I'm, um, we're excited to be joined today by our three wonderful panelists. Thank you, Melissa Vogel, Rodney Collins, and Chris Denning for joining us. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, Dr. Vogel is currently the Director of Qualitative Research at Hanover Research, which is also Professor Emirata of Anthropology at Clemson University, and she's the founding director of the Business Anthropology Program at Clemson. Her 20 years of academic research focused mostly on coastal Peru, and now she's leading a team of 12 as a full-time practitioner of business anthropology. Um, and Dr. Rodney Collins is a cultural anthropologist I'm currently a director of uh, Truth Central at McCann World World Group in London. Uh, Dr. Collins leads and coordinates Truth Central Large Network, um, a team of quantitative, qualitative, and analytic experts um, across uh, Europe in, um, and also in, 30, in 38 countries uh, in Europe. And at McCann, like, among his many accomplishments, um, he's developed the proprietary uh, ethnographic research tool, the Truth App. So it's exciting to see ethnography kind of at work in these kinds of settings. Um, and I've also learned recently that among the different languages that Dr. Khan speaks, he also knows a little bit of Russian. So I'm from Russia myself originally, so that's always a fun discovery. And uh, last but not least is Chris Deming. Thank you for joining us as well. Chris is a... Um, a uh, design anthropologist with a passion for built environment. He's a Virginia native. His initial education and experience are in political science and activism. And in 2017, he's, a, he's earned a um, PhD in social anthropology from Durham University um, in the UK. His work today focuses on public space and urban anthropology. Um, and he um, uh, is really engaged in conversations that negotiate and mobilize interpersonal relationships. Uh, that was, sorry, that was his research, but today he's really involved uh, in thinking about technology on the startup community, as well as uh, reimagining the workplace. Uh, there probably is uh, no better time to be a workplace anthropologist than today. So we're excited to have you, Chris, join us. So once again, thank you and welcome. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to monitor the chat for any questions from the audience. Um, today we're um, running the, the, uh, the panel as a webinar, which means we can only really see our panelists, but we welcome and encourage questions in chat. Um, feel free to type in a question during the conversation. Or after, and we'll spend some time, we'll devote some time after our, our roundtable as well to address questions from, from the audience. All right, so Matt, take it away. Thanks, Yulia. Appreciate it. And thanks, uh, everybody who's joined us today. And again, thanks to all the guests. So, um, we, you know, we heard a little bit about your background there, but if you could maybe just take, you know, a minute, two minutes maximum, could you give us a sort of a brief, understanding of what your life looked like in terms of research prior to the pandemic, just so that we have sort of a base to sort of build off of. And, um, you know, I'll kind of go in order of maybe of the way I see, see you all right now. So Rodney, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, really good to be with you. Um, so research prior to the pandemic, I suppose, um, the biggest shift that I've experienced in the past sort of year is really the speed um, by which we're doing research. Um, I, you know, as an anthropologist, 
I think a lot of us as anthropologists think of us ourselves as sort of lone researchers. And that's sort of the sort of standard structure or the habitus of an anthropologist that you go out into the field as an individual. You have a field site and you conduct research on your own. In my case, I work as part of a pretty big team of strategists, quants, analysts, um, social media experts. And so I'm just one of many disciplines coming together. And in the context of the pandemic, very early on, we aggregated even more people, we congregated more people together to sort of pursue um, an understanding of the dynamics on the ground as people were experiencing them around the world. So our um, sort of, we might have worked, I think Julia alluded to this, um, sort of in regions. Um, so I very much focused on Europe as a region, uh, conducting sort of grounded research and partnership with folks across that network. But at the time of the pandemic, we sort of became much more global. I think that's the first thing that sort of happened to us is that our connectivity was just so much more facilitated by the context of the pandemic and the ambitions to learn more about what was happening in various parts of the world as signals for what we could sort of anticipate and respond to. Um, the other thing is I could, I could, I could spend time doing um, uh, site visits um, across the region. I could bring folks into our agency. And I was training a group of Gen Z anthropologists um, just before the pandemic, where I had sort of recruited um, a crew of young people in sort of four countries. And we were sort of prototyping a model in which we were going to upskill these young people with some basics in ethnographic observation, interviewing and reporting, and then sort of, um, you know, sort of build a community that would live online, but would also be something that would be activated on a sort of uh, regular basis. Um, so those sort of on the ground connections obviously uh, stopped. Um, and then I suppose the other thing that has that sort of changed um, is just by, I mean, as I said, this, the pace. Um, I think the, the pace of research, we would invest in sort of big blockbuster studies. Um, the work that we do is, is sort of fueling the strategic community of our organization. Um, and so we would be very diligent and comprehensive about an approach to a topic. So say it's wellness or say it's um, globalization. Um, and the pace would be sort of, you know, from start to finish about a year. Um, and so that has really changed. Uh, we produced, I think, about 10 reports in the last year that were very um, sort of responsive to the context that we were living in. So I think pace um, has really changed, obviously, for everyone, just the groundedness of it and the sort of the, the, the human um, contact and face-to-face -face dynamics. And then um, just the sort of the, the scale in terms of like low ge geographical scale. So I think those things have been the primary shifts. Got it. And uh, Melissa, you're in a similar role in which you know you're sort of leading a team. So can you maybe also share you know what your what it looked like for you previously and now? Yeah, I can try. I I have to say the timing of my arrival at Hanover almost completely coincided with the beginning of the pandemic. So I had one month in the office before. Um, things started shutting down and we were wrapping up in-person focus groups right before everything shut down for the pandemic. So uh, I don't have a lot of pre-pandemic experience to share from my team. Um, I was actually still an academic, if you want to go back a few more months. So we were definitely, you know, my students were doing in-person research and I was training students in person, although I did teach online in the summers. Um, so, you know, just like what Rodney said, I think the biggest change for us was, um, you know, not being able to offer in-person options anymore for research and really, you know, having to deal with a little pushback in our case from both clients and our sales team who, you know, until people really got on board with the, no, this is serious, you know, we got to protect people, uh, still were wanting to, you know, schedule in-person research um, and now we're dealing with the latter end of that, which is, okay, when can you get back to in-person <laughs> research? Although luckily, because this has gone on long enough, 
people are not as pushy now as they might have been when it first started and we weren't sure how serious this was going to be. Um, so, you know, we're taking our time getting back to in-person research and figuring out what sorts of protocols we need to set up to be comfortable to do that again. Um, I thought it was really interesting that Rodney mentioned pace um, because, and I would love to hear what Chris has to say about this as a workplace anthropologist. One of the things I was hoping we would touch on is um, the massive switch to working 100% remote for my team has put an incredible amount of pressure on them. And we have at this point, you know, some serious burnout issues going on um, because they are all, of course, I'm very proud of my team, but they are all very diligent researchers who care very much about what they're doing. And I have to tell them, stop, like get off the computer, you know, <laughs> like because now that they're not coming to the office, there's not an obvious, you know, end point always. Um, and we've also tried to be flexible about their work hours because of things like, you know, childcare. I have an eight-year-old that for the first three months of the pandemic was home 24-7 with no school and no childcare. So um, I would love to, if we have time, get into the sort of, you know, workplace professional issues that people have been coping with and what we want to learn from and keep and what we don't want to keep uh, from the pandemic era. So. Sure. And, and we'll definitely get there. Um, but Chris, so, you know, you, you have a background that you did some work in UX now, you know, more so in workplace, but you're, you're doing a lot of freelancing. So a little bit different than being embedded in a large organization. So how has, you know, what, what did your pre COVID and, and post COVID look like? Pre COVID it's actually, I was um, also leading research, but on a startup. And so um, I had a team of researchers with me, but we were all remote. And kind of ironically or not, I was also transitioning a lot. So at that point, I was still living in Budapest in Hungary. So I actually returned back to uh, Richmond, Virginia in about January of 2020. So about, I would say, two months before the pandemic actually hit. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think just from, uh, from my perspective with the, with the prop tech startup, I mean, um, for us, the research and everything was operating at a different pace than I think you might find in a more corporate environment. Um, I mean, just because of how things, how just the necessity. And so um, the biggest projects we could do would be like uh, maybe four-ish months of do about four weeks of doing interviews and then four weeks of like something else. But that would be like the most intense bit. And then the rest, it would be like a two-week sprint of user uh, interviews, maybe people living in London on their experiences of living in a neighborhood. So that would be like a two-week project, another two-week project, another two-week project. But they would all be, I would say, almost, I mean, at that point, by necessity, since I was doing some of the work too. So a lot of it was also remote and a lot of it was also by Zoom. So um, I remember experiencing some Zoom burnout myself, actually, like during that time period. So in a way, like kind of what I was kind of experiencing a bit could have been sort of foreshadowing what Melissa's team may be going through right now. But um, so that was before the pandemic. And then, I mean, right now, like, um, so I'm working with a small organization called, a smaller organization called Facility Quest. They're a workplace management software company. So I'm helping them to figure out what kinds of data needs strategies might have. But then I'm also kind of doing other roles. I'm also sort of helping out with uh, business development sometimes. And um, online is kind of like me wearing different hats just because it's a small organization. At that point, I mean, also the pace of research is pretty quick because I did, yeah, one month was focus groups, another month was interviews. And then uh, also I'm working with a commercial real estate organization to look at really the experience of remote working that people have, especially if they're kind of not working in the office. And that one, I mean, that one is, I would say it's more about thought leadership and it's more about an organization's perspective. And so that one is a little bit longer just because of the, not necessarily the methodological rigor, but the thorough nature of the research and how it's meant to shape a perspective. So, I mean, they're all kind of different situations. And so for me, it's kind of 
hard to say that one thing was definitely one way or one thing is definitely another before and after the pandemic. I think it there might be a bit of an assumption that work before the pandemic was always in person. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, certainly my own experience, it's by no means always in person, especially working in tech. But just to maybe clarify one thing. So, Chris, you know, you were doing a lot of uh, work online already. Was it, it sounds like you, you know, your team sounds like is maybe in one location and was doing, you know, mostly work in person. Correct me if I'm wrong. And Rodney, you had a team that spread out, it sounds like across multiple countries. So you're already working remotely in a sense. But were you also doing uh, research remote already? Yeah, I mean, we'd already sort of conducted a, a number of sort of we built online communities. We had sort of done discussion boards. I mean, different methodologies that enabled us to sort of um, uh, connect with um, you know different types of audiences or communities, you know, across regions. Um, but I think that the sort of um, you know, obviously the ethnographic component. I have a cat that's wandering around here, so I just say hello to him, uh, Senor Francisco. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think largely what we're doing is sort of tapping into our sort of partners in market to conduct the research that we design at the center. Um, and so a lot of the work we're doing is activating. Um, our, our sort of regional partners to conduct the research um, and then sort of we, you know, just conduct the sort of global meta analysis of that. Um, so in some ways, I think what, I mean, what's really changed in that context is that um, we have, I mean, there's so many changes. I, I mean, it's sort of astonishing. I mean, you're asking us to reflect on this and I think I think I know what has happened, but then just given this opportunity to to consider it, I realize that things like, the, the level of engagement in the intricacies of a research project or initiative um, has, has decreased on a local level, but the pace by which we deliver global intelligence has increased, which is an interesting uh, dynamic that I, I don't think any of us have sort of clocked or planned, you know, you couldn't really plan for this. Um, and that's, that's for a lot of reasons. I, I mean, it's sort of organizations going through a lot of change um, as a result of the pandemic. So I think, you know, I, it's no, probably no surprise to anybody on this call that research in many organizations is something that um, a research role is often times, you know, a cost center. Um, and so, you know, sort of seeing that the cost of research, investing in research is something that can, you know, is, 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 is one of the first things that an organization is willing to cut. Which is interesting about this particular context is that the importance of research has never been more apparent to people across the organization. So I, I think these dynamics are so different than what I could have anticipated going into this, 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 this situation. So as we sort of see a lot of stripping of the fat of an organization, I mean, I say fat is sort of a colloquialism, not because I, don't, I think that way, but the organization sort of creating a leanness in order to navigate um, the, this economic context, certain types of priorities um, that were apparently sort of exploratory, experimental, those types of, those types of behaviors becoming a little less prominent in the periphery of an organization um, and then shored up at the center of an organization that I, that I work in. So um, what that means is um, we, you know, two years ago we did, or three years ago we did a project where we activated a hundred markets across the world to do grounded research uh, for a day, um, design protocols, sent people out, I mean, the entire organization out to do a little bit of grounded research, um, ethnographic interviews, and sort of like photo, photo projects. Obviously, something of that scale and, you know, that involvement and that sort of, um, uh, sort of expansiveness is sort of gone, right? Like there's no, there's no possibility of doing that. Um, but what can happen is sort of an intensity on a sort of, on a single initiative, sort of tracking um, the dynamics of the impact of COVID on sort of cultural truths. And I think, but it becomes more, much more centralized um, and the periphery sort of becomes less involved in this. Um, so what that does to sort of your, you know, your initial question around sort of remote sort of research 
the behaviors, I mean, the, the sort of supply chain of research intelligence is a little bit shorter as most supplies, you know, sort of supply chains were disrupted in the last year. Thanks. And, you know, so there's there's obviously some difference between everybody tonight, which is great. Um, and Randy, thanks for sharing all that. It's it's interesting to hear how, you know, research has become so prominent in your organization because early on, you know, in, in some large tech companies, we saw actually an exiting of, of many researchers. So, you know, obviously there's even some, some differences there that are interesting to dig into. But and Matt, I'm sorry, could I just clarify real quick? I, I was highlighting the sort of pushback we've gotten about in-person research, but actually that's always been the minority of work that my team does. So the vast majority of work that we do is remote, always has been remote. So uh, it, there's only there's never been conflict though over that because it's always been available. And obviously we were able to then take our focus groups online during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I mean, we do remote everything now and we were doing remote some things before and some things in person so so building on that then was so you're already doing some remote but there's new needs you know at this point so what has changed for you what have you had to bring in anything additional into the research practice to address those needs yeah i mean i'm sure it's a lot of the same things that other people have done when you know in person research became uh, not feasible anymore. So, you know, apparently the director before me was, I, I really have no idea why, but vehemently opposed to doing online focus groups. I'm not sure why she just didn't like the idea. Um, but I had no problem with that. So we immediately, the first change that we made, uh, when we, you know, uh, realized it wasn't going to be possible to do in person was we immediately came up with standard operating procedures and protocols and templates and everything for taking our focus group practice online. And we do, we were already doing, you know, asynchronous like bulletin board focus groups, but we really, really promoted the online synchronous focus groups. And very quickly, they became our second most popular product after our sort of standard phone IDIs. Um, so we did that right away. We also came up with a couple more innovative things to sell, like instead of being able to do, you know, in person, I had some, I don't, I, I don't want to use too many acronyms. I don't know who our audience is. So, you know, meaning in-home user tests, um, we made sure to let our clients know that we can do those via video conference too. So, you know, if they have a product they want to ship to our uh, participants, we can get on a video call with them and have them, you know, use the product, interact with the product. We, we usually do those for uh, food manufacturers. So it's very easy to have somebody, you know, open a package, prepare some food, eat the food while we're inter interviewing them. And then one that we've tried to launch and hasn't been as popular was trying to get remote shop alongs going. But as you can imagine, you know, shopping in store <laughs> wasn't happening that much either. So that one hasn't taken off as much, having people take us with them on their phones during a video call. Um, but we always had done sort of, I mean, I'm sure nothing compared to what Chris is used to doing, but little UX light, we call it, <laughs> sort of uh, UX screen sharing IDIs. And those took up a little bit more time too, a little more popularity. Thanks, and Chris, how about yourself? I mean, I think one of the big challenges of doing workplace research is that, I mean, if you're talking about corporate offices, which is often what I focus on, very few people are actually in them. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule. And so often when we talk about people at home, we're often talking about those who are referred to as knowledge workers. And so those people who buy their roles and buy perhaps the privilege they have and by um, just being able to do stuff they have remotely, they're able to continue to be working um, from home. And I think due to the pandemic, I mean, and the, the shift to the home, then what that meant was that a lot of those offices where someone like me would normally do be doing research, they were empty. <laughs> and so one of the challenges, I mean, it's kind of strange, I agree with Rodney here, that um, there is a big interest right now in using research and using eth ethnography and other methods associated with anthropology to really understand the experience of people who work remotely as well as those who are in the office. The catch is that you have to be able to discuss 
remote methods and you have to be able to discuss remote ethnography because if you can't, then that limits your ability to do research, especially in a workplace context, workplace sort of office context. So that's kind of what the focus is. And so a lot of what I'm doing right now is, I mean, I there are a lot of safety implications of doing ethnography in person and none of them are really all that like great for either the person who'd be doing it or the potential participant. And so really what um, I've been doing personally is I'm doing um, sort of photo exercises, photo diary exercises, photo journaling. I'm also doing, I mean, the standard remote interviews, but then also a type of um, day in the life of trying to look at the, ask the person who's working remotely how they go through the day and or and then when you do that you see the shifts of working or not working or then different things that come up throughout the day and that's proven to be particularly effective i think those things are useful i do want to do go into some of the stuff like what rodney was talking about with uh, digital ethnography or ethnography i think that's particularly powerful i think uh going forward though i think if you're talking about workplace research in general i think you're going to be seeing a lot of stuff happening in person. I mean, I've been getting reach outs about pilot tests for new environments. And so, I mean, I know the time is coming pretty soon to do research in person again. Um, so that may happen at some point soon. I think though that like, given that how many people are gonna be working in a quote hybrid context, then there is always going to be this sort of question of, okay, so how do we track how people working remotely versus that? versus in the office, particularly given there may be shifts between two days at the office and three at home. So it's about how do you actually look at that process of transitioning from one point to another? And I think that's what um, I think ethnography in general is about transitions. It is about temporality. It is about those flows. But I think if you're talking about this context, like in a workplace environment, um, it is going to be about how do you look at the shift from home to um the office and back and forth and then these points of working and not working and how does the work time get extended like what melissa said so i think it's going to be a lot of flexibility particularly in this kind of i would say built environment context and so in there you know you you talk about a little bit of you know you learned in in some sense like that you needed to sell the remote work you're obviously learning a little bit about how the changing nature of work but any other key takeaways that are maybe more sort of methodological in terms of you know what you're doing from a research perspective that you learned any like big successes that you realize that you really want to carry with you going forward yeah i'm finding that the uh, interviews with people who work remotely are particularly powerful there um, and i think one reason is that some of these concepts, like we were asking people about how they experience their um, the meetings that they attend or their collaboration, as soon as you get into something resembling organizational culture as a topic, people get really excited and really emotive about it. And I think just that uh, that sort of experience of using an interview to look at the flow throughout the day, that is something I plan to continue going forward because I'm finding it to be very rich. Great. And Melissa, how about you? Do you think you'll stick with the focus groups or do you think there's anything else that really stands out that you've learned that you really want to pull forward? Yeah, I mean, the online synchronous focus groups, I think, are fabulous um, because you can bring together people from, you know, different countries, time zones, you know, in a way that doing in person is much more difficult. So I think it offers a real value add to our clients if they want to do, you know, like a nationwide or regional audience that you wouldn't necessarily be able to bring together in person. Um, although sometimes, again, talking about workplace culture, it's been a stretch for my researchers if they're dealing with a population that's, you know, in Europe or West Coast, or uh, I think we even did one in Australia. So that was a real stretch. Um, and I think uh, the recruitment piece, if anybody uh, wants to share about this, because I, I really feel like that was something that really changed with the pandemic, because you're trying to recruit participants during these difficult times, you know, we're, in my organization, we're serving like multiple external clients at one time, and with a team of 12, we usually have about 40 to 50 projects simultaneously across the team. And so, you know, to try and explain to those clients, like it doesn't work 
for us to keep hassling people. Like people's lives are upside down right now. And so we will do our best to get you a good set of participants, but not at the point of alienating all the people you want to reach out to. And that was a real challenge, especially last summer. Um, it's definitely gotten better since then. Um, but I would say the first six months of the pandemic, recruiting participants got really tough, especially with, you know, obvious populations that were hard to reach, like healthcare workers, grocery workers, anybody frontline workers, any of those folks um, got really tough to reach. And we even had, you know, students, for example, who were just, you know, emotionally distraught when we would reach out to them for our, like, say, for our higher ed clients. Um, and, you know, my researchers, we literally had to have a couple of little, we do knowledge sharing groups as like a monthly training. And we had to have a session or two on like how as a researcher to deal with trauma that comes up during your interviews with people. And then how do you cope as a researcher with having to, you know, process all that as part of your research. And, you know, that's probably going to be an ongoing thing because, um, you know, especially with all the different events happening, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, from the pandemic, from, you know, violence against people of color, uh, all sorts of political events going on, you know, there's always the chance that you're going to be reaching out to participants who are going through a really rough time, and you're face, well, not face to face, but voice to voice with them. And so, um, helping our researchers cope with that, I think is another really important piece we can take from the pandemic. You're muted, Matt. Thanks, thanks, Ronnie. Uh, and I would just add to that, um, so that Code for America is doing a lot of work on trauma-informed design, and so they have a big component on research, of course, as part of that. And I know Matt Bernie, as you probably many people on this call are aware of, he's, you know, trying to share that information right now. So you could look up Code for America or, or maybe him and, and find quite a bit on that. But the, so just to Matt, kind of, yeah, go on. Can I build on this, this topic? I mean, I guess I was just like the takeaways around, around research. I think that there is, um, there's something different that happened in the past year, which wasn't about sort of like our traditional offering of sort of um, conducting research with consumers out in the world and bringing it back in and being the voice of, of the person. I think what has happened is because everything has been in question, absolutely everything was in question, that tools to, to establish a form of inquiry that would provide some type of answer, intelligence, across an organization, across our organization, was was so meaningful and useful. So um, whether that's thinking about the you know ways of working, thinking about mental wellness across the organization, thinking about how we respond to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, demands, like all of those, all of those sort of um, units and disciplines and cultural behaviors within the organization, um, and also with our partner organizations or clients, were in question. And so even the incremental possibility of introducing an anthropological uh, framework or a theory or, a, you know, I, you know I, I revisited Victor Turner's um, uh, rites of passage, you know, obviously taken from Van Gennep, Von Gennep, but that was a way to understand crisis um, and to think about crisis and to embed that in a sort of a model that could be used by teams across the world. So um, I think that those that was something that was a bit different. I mean, it wasn't so much about methodology or about conducting research. It was about providing a, sort of a, a set of tools to partners across the organization as they ask questions about their given discipline or sort of remit in the organization, which was, I don't think, very exciting, actually. But it's also, you know, um, I just, yeah, it's inspiring, but I also think, I also question the next, you know, the next stage when we're, we're not questioning anymore. We feel like we're a bit back in normalcy. Do we sort of, you know, that's, that's to be determined. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was just going to ask. You know, in your case, do you think you might slide backwards there? Do you think external partners may not be so interested I mean, so far, all indicators suggest, and this may be, I mean, I'd love to hear everybody else's opinion about this. This may be because of um, 
the sort of sense of ambiguity that we have or the sort of like, you know, because remote existence has robbed us of the certainty that we have in understanding the people we engage with. So, you know, body language, nonverbal communication, uh, energy that we share in a space, um, being able to see like, you know, somebody's shoes and, you know, their, their hand behavior, you know, all that stuff, creating some sort of anxiety in people's minds and sort of latent paranoia. Generally, I think as an individual has, I think, fostered a general interest in under and connecting more with people outside and out in the world and sort of believing that we're sort of like, can, can I get closer? Um, and what are the ways to do that? And so you turn to, you know, ethnographers, you turn to online communities, you turn to, and I think all of those things have been really fostered in this context. Um, and so I wonder if we sort of return to a, a world in which we sort of have much more regular engagement it, person to person, face to face, if that sort of that anxiety or that alertness and sort of dissipates and we sort of feel like we don't have to question as much and we don't need as much intelligence to fill in the gaps um, that sort of appear so strong to us right now. And do you have a plan as an organization of how you're going back, uh, fully back, hybrid, yeah, I mean, we're because we are global, um, we're, you know, so many different um, dynamics and conditions across markets. I mean, you know, I think, you know, we have partners in India who are, you know, I mean, it's quite sensitive to even involve, I mean, for me, to even involve them in a sort of a discovery process because I'm so aware and sensitive to the fact that there is such um, such a strong moment of crisis for them um so we're at so all different phases of this 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 cycle of crisis um but you know in the uk you know sort of we have a pandemic independence day coming up it's meant to be 21st of june um we're all supposed to sort of you know be returned to normal i think they're about to say you know i think yesterday boris johnson said that social distancing is something that we might let go of you know there's so there's the survey sort of, you know but we've been i mean not to be cynical, but we have been here before. Um, and, you know, I'm, I am super hopeful, but I, you know, no one believes that we will ever return to a hundred percent on site um, work behavior. That's just, you know, I think hybridity is very common. Lots of people want a two day work week in the office. Um, that's, you know, that's part of, you know, that's come up in surveys across the organization. So I don't, I do, I do see us, um, behaving as knowledge workers in that hybrid place. Um, but I am very excited to get out into the world and detect signals on the ground and not just through a mediated environment, um, sort of like see things in situ. I went to the Columbia Red Flower Market. I don't know if anybody knows it in the, in the UK. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wholesale flower market. And just witnessing fashion on the street, um, you know, sort of, pandemic post-pandemic fashion was so exciting because it was new signals and it was um spontaneous and it was haphazard and you know i didn't select and you know invite i didn't convene that group of people in that space and that was so exciting to be in a spontaneous community that was experiencing something um and for you know diverse reasons so i'm really excited about the possibility of connecting with um communities not on the basis of work or sort of already established relationships. So I think that that is something very much we can all look for and um, very important to the, you know, sort of the events um, and sort of experience designers amongst us. So, yeah. And so first, thanks for, you know, pointing out the fact that we are here kind of talking about moving beyond the pandemic, but of course the whole globe is not, and we should recognize that. And um, so thanks for bringing that up. But, you know, you're talking about experience there and, and Melissa, you were talking about the experience of your employees. And so I'd love to maybe, you know, kind of stay on this thread for a moment and talk about, you know, what you're learning from that, what you might do about that going forward, you know, what, what you see that you could, um, what you've learned from that and how you might address that. And then maybe we could, Chris, tie that into some of the work, you know, that you do in the workplace space. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing that has been a bit of a rough adjustment for me 
So having been an academic who ran my own projects, who had a lot more control over the conditions under which my team worked, and I actually very rarely worked as like sort of what Rodney mentioned, the stereotypical sole anthropologist. I was almost always at least with a partner, if not a larger team, even in my academic work. Um, it's been very frustrating to be honestly kind of middle management in a company where I don't have that same power and control over my team members' work lives. Um, I mean, I have a certain amount as the team leader, but um, you know, there's obviously a whole layer above me that uh, I have to work with to try and get what I need for my people. And, you know, that's been a very new experience for me to have to really um, negotiate. And I never have claimed to be a good politician <laughs> or diplomat or anything like that. Um, and it can be hard because, you know, I can tell how, you know, I did have a few team members that were already full time remote before the pandemic, but the policy had been, well, once you've worked here for a while and proved to us that you can handle it, you get a little time remote. And then if you need to move and you've been doing well, OK, then we'll try you full time remote. So uh, we went from, you know, you sort of had to earn that remote work uh, option to like, well, well, nobody has a choice. You're all remote. And so for some people, that was, you know, fantastic and a blessing, especially with how expensive it is to live here in the DC suburbs. A lot of folks started moving to less expensive places. Some of the younger folks even moved back in with family. Um, but it also was really hard on, uh, like I felt really blessed that I'm at a point in my life where, you know, I have my partner, my child, like even if we were isolated, we weren't alone in our isolation. And I have some younger folks who, you know, they had an apartment by themselves in Arlington. And now they're like practically living as shut-ins, you know, um, until things started opening back up again. But even once they did, you know, I have some team members who have to be, oh my gosh, Rodney, I love your cat. She's it just reminds me of mine, <laughs> uh, who I locked out. <laughs> I have um, I put the door, he got in. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so, so, you know, I really have worried and to this day, I'm still worried about a few of my team members who don't have folks that they live with, who haven't gotten to spend a lot of time with their families and friends over the last year. And in some cases, what I started to say was uh, may have like asthma or something that really makes them concerned about exposing themselves to the virus. So uh, yeah, it's it's been tough. One of the main things we've tried to do, of course, being flexible about work hours and saying like, look, as long as you show up to the meetings and interviews and things that you're supposed to be at, if you need to rearrange your work hours to just deal with life, I don't care. That's totally fine with me. Um, but the other thing is just trying to get, get people to take time off. I think this is a at least a na nationwide, if not a global problem, that people have accumulated so much vacation time. And then, of course, they're not taking it because where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Right. And, um, you know, now we're really like seeing people who are so fried and so burnt out because they weren't taking vacations. Even if they took a day or two off, you know, what are they doing? They're w watching Netflix at home because there wasn't anywhere to go or anything to do or people they could hang out with. So I think, you know, as things at least again, depending where you are, hopefully are improving you know, really encouraging people to like, try to get out, try to connect with people face to face, try to break up that isolation. And, and I've just been, we've been giving like extra team days off, just, we're not working today, go away, go do something fun. <laughs> so yeah, and I, there was something else I was going to say about what Rodney said, and now I just lost it. Um, so come back to me later. Well, one of the things that you know I found interesting in there is you talked about options a little bit, and you know we just saw the other day say you know uh, Google talking about the options. So many of us have kind of said, is it hybrid? Is it going back to the office? But it actually does sound like in a lot of cases there are going to be options going forward in which you get to to pick. And so, Chris, have have you seen anything in that space that's worth commenting on? So 
in terms of flexibility and options that are appearing? Uh, yeah, and really, you know, how businesses are providing options to employees and what that might mean for retention and how that in itself changes the dynamic of the office. This is uh, this, uh, this is one of those kind of, so conventionally, the idea is that the hybrid model is going to appear. And so the hybrid model is this concept that appeared more so in the media back over the summer which kind of refers to this idea of combining in-person and remote. And that's, I mean, one thing probably we've all heard the term hybrid, but the hybrid generally is that, but it's very ill understood. And hybrid means a different thing for every organization because hybrid is essentially a combination of stuff. And so that's what um, organizations realize. And that's kind of where some of the discomfort is coming from because all of a sudden, we have to think, okay, so what do we actually need? And so one of the things that um, I'm hopeful organizations are doing is that they hope that they're not just looking at what their competitor is doing, like Google, and they're hopefully they're not just going look at Google and say, okay, we want to Google one. And But that may not work because not every organization is built on a huge, massive complex like Google is. And so um, one thing I've been kind of wary of is this idea of uh, kind of I've started coining this term Mick hybrid to refer to sort of a hybrid model that's appearing in different places, but is essentially one that's based off of what you observe that's happening somewhere else. Now, to get back to your question, um, more directly on what companies are doing, it's really difficult to say because when a president or somewhere maybe, I mean, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Apple and Microsoft make a lot of buzz every time one of them one of their executives moves and makes a statement regarding remote work. It is sometimes not accurate. And sometimes it doesn't really reflect what's actually going to happen. And even like with, with uh, Jamie Dimon and um, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, we've been seeing a whole lot of flip-flopping. JP Morgan at one point said, no, we're, we're all going back to the office back in September. Well, cases rose. And so they had to shift everyone back uh, into remote. And then, they go, okay, no, we're going hybrid. And it's this constant flip-flopping that's going back and forth, sometimes on, not really on a whim, but it's kind of on the basis of what they see happening at the moment. But some of these things, it's a bit like a game, almost. It's the way to differentiate with competitors. So it's really hard to say exactly which way companies are going because so many of them are figuring it out right now. Um, I would... It makes sense that some organizations are going to prioritize what they see as being employee experience. And the idea would be that you offer more flexibility. And if you offer more flexibility, then that will allow someone to might be a selling point. So they might go for the organization that offers flexibility remote work versus the one that says, no, you're all going back into the office on Monday. Enjoy. Um, the trick is though, that that's not necessarily the case the finance industry is going probably trending more so to being in person rather than remote and part of that is due to a management culture that's very focused on kind of surveillance and watching what others are doing that's not the same as somewhere like google or maybe apple or one of the many like smaller startups or it's not really and it's really it varies um one thing that's kind of also difficult to consider is even if you look at employee experience surveys, a lot of those surveys, it's one that I've kind of found and sort of observed, sometimes they're getting lower and lower participation rates, and that's due to a form of survey burnout. Where So even the employee pulse surveys aren't really reflective of what the sometimes what the population wants within a company. It could be about like, um, so those who respond, it could be because they have an axe to grind or because they're really happy, but it's one of those two. And then there is this huge, massive amount that isn't responding one way or another. So it's, again, how do you judge it and how do you go from there? And that's what a lot of organizations are really considering right now. Yeah, great. So to I want to maybe sort of try to wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so so that we can get to questions. So. With that in mind, you know, we, we're obviously talking about a lot of changes, changes in, in how we're conducting research, so that's changes in methodologies, changes in the way that we're looking at the workforce uh, in terms of who we lead, how we're, you know, where we are in terms of uh, physical location. With all of that in mind, um, what 
based on you know the experience you've all gone through, what would you like to leave behind from all this? And this is going to be a two-parter. And what do you really see us as anthropologists contributing going forward post, post-pandemic? And Chris, you can maybe start if you want. Sure. So I think one thing I've really enjoyed is the ease of connecting. I'm part of this sort of group called Workplace Evolutionaries, and we have these, the sort of group I've come into contact with them, even though they're based in San Francisco, I came into contact through a virtual meetup that appeared on LinkedIn. And the person who organized it just happened to be really accessible. And every, a lot of people from across North America, and also even in Europe and sometimes in Southeast Asia go. And I think that's just because of how easy it is to make connections right now, just through a remote like context through Zoom. I mean, if someone has available in the same time zone, or someone is available at the same time as you are, even if they're in a different time zone, then you can just meet with them. And it's very easy. And I think virtual events are make attendance a bit more accessible. It kind of, it allows for connecting to happen. And that's one thing I don't really want to lose going forward is if we have a shift into in-person, then there might be a lot of people who'd be very interested in a New York event, for example, but they don't really live in New York. They might live in Virginia or DC. So it could be more difficult for people to attend something after the pandemic kind of sadly um so that's one thing i don't really want to lose but i mean going forward i think i'm just in general not just workplace but in general in organizations i think organizations see perhaps even more value right now in understanding what's happening given how i mean every time period is unstable in some way but given how the pandemic context has gone and given how we're not really going to be in a post-pandemic context. I I think post-pandemic is a bit of a misnomer. Um, But just given what's happened and given how much instability there's been, how much uncertainty there's been, I think that's led to more demand for strategic insight. And so that's where I think anthropologists can plug into. I can talk more about a workplace context and how we anthropologists are going to be in more demand to look at what forms of work are happening and understand culture within organizations, culture and quotes, of course. Um, but the, I really think it's going to be about strategy. And I think that's where anthropologists can plug in. Great. And so uh, Rodney, I'm going to jump to you because it sounds like you do quite a bit of work, you know, in the strategy space already. So you want to, anything you want to build on there? And again, my kind of two part question, what might you want to leave behind based on this learned experience and you know, what do you think anthropology will contribute? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. What do I want to leave behind? Um, I, and I, I think I agree with Chris around um, this sort of, in you know, this the type of access that we've gained to other communities over the course of the last year has been kind of amazing. I mean, even this conversation, Yulia reached out to me at some point. Um, last sort of last fall. Um, and that kind of context is, I think, um, you know, a, a sort of um, a product of what the dynamic of culture is now, in which it's much more um, hot, like it, people can imagine connecting with people that they've never met in person before and reaching out to them and connecting with them and feeling like if you hear a fantastic podcast, maybe as somebody, a guest on your show, on your podcast, Matt, um, is heard and, you know, you look that person up on LinkedIn and you contact them because they said something interesting. I think that kind of behavior has been cultivated in this context. And I think that that's pretty amazing. And so I'm really excited about that sort of like that shift in our thinking about who is within reach and who is, you know, sort of out of reach. And so that, and that sort of generosity that comes with, there's sort of a generosity loop that I think has been cultivated over the last year. So those are things that really excite me and I really would like to take those things forward. I think leaving behind, I mean, we're, we're sort of, we're shedding things very quickly, aren't we? We're sort of like adopting things and shedding them very fast over the past year. I mean, we've like, you know, pe- like there were so many things, like sort of trends that we picked up. We're like, okay, we're going to do pub quizzes now. Don't talk about those anymore. Um, bread making, we're going to do that now. Let's not talk about that anymore. I mean, there's, I think we just, we're trying out so many things and like the traction is just not there. And we're just shedding them really fast. 
the, the, because they're just not, they're not ultimately meaningful to all of us, right? And we're sort of just sort of responding to these things because we have a limited range of, of sort of signals that we take on. But I do, I mean, I, I suppose that this, um, so this is a bit deeper in culture that I, I would like something to be left behind. And I, this is a big pipe dream and this, you know, maybe you can all help me rally and maybe we can have some impact collectively as anthropologists and sort of advocates for change. Um, but I think what I've witnessed most um, common in the last year is this sort of exceptionalism of different communities and different cultures and different nations. And like that there is this sort of belief that, um, you know, Germany had it just three months ago, you know, sort of four months ago that they'd sort of conquered this virus and they were sort of beyond it and they'd sort of overcome. And now they're in lockdown and it's quite grim. Um, you know, the, this, ha this sort of regularity of the belief that my culture is exceptional and that we're not susceptible to the things that we're witnessing across the world. And I think that this, I, I, I sort of had the hope that this, you know, this 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 common set of conditions and circumstances and experience would sort of chip away at that belief that's so deep. And um, but I'm I'm not so I'm not quite convinced that it's happen it's going to happen. But I'm still a little bit hopeful that it'll sort of shift things a little bit, sort of crack away at the sense that we are fundamentally different and exceptional, and because we live in this particular location we're not going to be victim um, to these types of these types of events or these circumstances. So yeah, I think as anthropologists, we can keep showing like shining, you know, holding up the mirror to this dynamic and, you know, hopefully that story gets told enough that, you know, that there is a pattern and that pattern includes us. And I think that's a nice transition to, to Melissa, really, right, as an educator is still being involved in the Clemson certificate. So, Melissa, maybe you want to answer the original question and then, you know, maybe we'll, we'll wrap up with you and you can show the, the slide that you have and talk about how, you know, you're contributing to educating the next generation of anthropologists who can go out and realize Rodney's dream. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I like how Rodney put it. I was actually sim uh, thinking something similar, but I was thinking of it as more isolationism and the fact that I feel like on the one hand by somewhat by necessity people have been living a little bit more insular existence for most of the last year and had to really just focus on like taking care of themselves their close family or friends you know um but at least for me I'm a pretty regular pretty consistent uh news watcher and I, I've been really upset by how hard I have to search for news on how things are playing out in other countries. So, you know, if you're not really trying super hard to find out what's going on in the rest of the world, you don't have to ever hear about it because they're not really talking about it on a lot of the major networks. So, and yes, I'm old enough to still get my news on TV. <laughs> um, that probably tells you something about my age. But yeah, so I would love to leave behind, as Rodney was saying, this idea that like, you know, even if we had to for a while just to survive the virus, like we need to get back to interacting with other people, uh, being more aware of what's going on outside of our little tiny worlds. And obviously anthropology is directly related to that and always has been and hopefully always will be. Um, as far as what we can contribute, um, and what we can take with us from this period, you know, I was really thrilled that I, I've always believed and, you know, for the last several years have been trying to promote the idea that I think some of the best suited people to work on all of the diversity, equity and inclusion issues that have become come more to the forefront for a lot of businesses are anthropologists. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. And unfortunately, a few of the folks who are doing that work, I it makes no sense to me why they are the ones doing that work. So uh, I think anthropology is a real opportunity to expand into that space and use our cross-cultural knowledge and skills to cause some real great cultural change and make improvements in the DEI space. And it's been interesting, all the lessons learned, you know, 
getting back to participants, and I remembered what I was going to say earlier. It actually was in response to something somebody had mentioned in the chat. On the one hand, there's this tension between, like, I think Chris talked about the greater accessibility we've had with, you know, this remote existence where we can reach out to people around the world and, you know, all that we're worrying about is what time is it where you are, you know, kind of thing. Um, and that's been great to sort of, you know, um, feel that's more accessible or being able to attend a conference that if you had to travel to it and pay some big conference fee would have been totally cost prohibitive for some people. But with, you know, making it remote, a lot of conferences, you know, really knocked down their fees and made it way more accessible for people to attend. But at the same time, all of this dependence on technology is actually in some ways narrowing who we're reaching because, you know, we've had this problem with some of our clients' projects. They want to reach a population that has limited access to the internet or to the type of technology we need to actually connect with them. And we haven't been able to just, you know, go to that community and talk to them in person. And so we have to sometimes, unfortunately, tell clients, we need to shift to a different kind of project because the group of people you want to talk to just aren't accessible right now. They don't have regular access to internet. They don't have, you know, phones that can handle video conferencing, whatever. Um, and I really especially worry about like older populations that maybe I hate to, I don't mean to promote a stereotype, but might not be as technologically savvy or comfortable and, you know, don't really have an interest in joining, you know, a Zoom call or something like that. And how much are they getting left out of our research? So I think it's this weird tension between, on the one hand, greater accessibility in some ways and then narrowing uh, who can be a part of our research in other ways. So, and yes, thank you, Matt, for giving me a chance to talk about um, uh, the educational piece of this, which is, so uh, while I was uh, still at Clemson, I created a business anthropology program and we had just launched uh, right before I left the professional version. So the non-credit version, which is much more affordable. It was already completely online because it was aimed at professionals who are already, you know, out in the workplace, don't have time or interest in doing, you know, a full master's program where they're going to have to devote a, a ton of money to getting, giving for tuition and they don't need the credits and all that. They just want the knowledge, right? So uh, we sort of condensed what I did in the for credit version into a three short course certificate um, First, just a business anthropology overview, second, qualitative methods, and then third, a capstone seminar talking about teamwork, leadership, and strategic planning. Um, and so we only got to run it one time before the pandemic began, but I'm happy to say that we're finally going to get to run it again this fall. And I apologize because we just sort of started pulling this together, but I'm going to share a little bit more information here. make this full screen for everybody. Okay, there. So I, I, I am still totally reachable at this email address. If you are interested, please go ahead and email me. Unfortunately, because I have not had a chance to update this uh, graphic, don't bother with the phone number. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> and the, the email address, uh, I'm sorry, the URL up there, needs updating as well. But you can just search on Clemson's website for business anthropology certificate and you'll get to the right page. And please do feel free to contact me at my Clemson address if you're interested. Um, you know, over the summer, I'm going to be trying to collect names of interested people so that we can schedule this in a way that makes sense for folks. Um, when we did it the first time, I was so excited that we not only had participants here in the US, but we had uh, one in the UK and one in Germany. So we will do our best uh, scheduling wise to try and accommodate folks in various time zones. So thank you for letting me get that in there, Matt, and I'll stop sharing it. Sounds good, thanks. All right, so um, we have about 15 minutes to go. So we can take some questions. There's been a little chat, uh, some some questions in the chat, um, Yui, anything that you want to start with? Yeah, maybe um, 
I'll start by you know, thank you so much, first of all, for so many great ideas and uh, sharing your experiences over the past year. Um, I really think this is really a fantastic discussion. I have so many questions, and there are a few um, already that I've seen online as well. Uh, one question I want to ask you um, um, is what are the kinds of things that you, you know, I want to recenter us a little bit back on research. What do you miss about researching and um, conducting and uh, doing your work um, from before the pandemic? What are the kinds of things that you hope will return um, as we settle in into a kind of new normal? It was this too. So this is a kind of question to myself, whoever feels like taking it. Okay. I'd love to hear from everybody. What are the kinds of things that you wish you want to incorporate back into your practice? Okay. I mean, um, I remember for my uh, PhD, I mean, a lot of what I did was ethnography and like bars and cafes and in public spaces. So personally, I mean, I've done so much of my stuff. Um, virtually remote i'd rather do some face-to-face -face stuff again <laughs> so that's just my, my my response to that question i want to get back to doing some of the kind of stuff i used to do <laughs> i would like to begin the design of research without having it centered in the pandemic as the driver of behavior um, so really thinking about, you know, a world in which the determinant isn't uh, pandemically sort of oriented. So starting from a different departure point. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with both Rodney and Chris about, um, you know, hopefully not having to focus so much on the pandemic effects on whatever we're, we're looking at. Um, and of course, being able to do in-person research, being able to travel for research, especially internationally, I really miss that. Um, but again, not to harp on this, I really want my team to have normal lives again. Like I really, we're still in a space where I'm very worried, as you can tell. So I'm really looking forward to the researchers themselves feeling like they have more healthy whole lives because they bring that, of course, to their work. So. Uh, thank you. That's great. Uh, maybe a, a, a follow-up question to that. Um, how do you view virtual ethnography? Um, I know, uh, Melissa, you've met, you, you mentioned that your organization has been doing a lot of virtual work already, and uh, the transition was smoother. Rodney, you're saying that um, you, can, you kind of amplified and wrapped up those efforts. Chris, you're doing a lot of work online. Um, is virtual ethnography, in your view, bona fide ethnography? Um, and maybe a kind of a, a you know companion question is how has doing research online you know, if you've already been doing it in, you know doing it in more uh, in larger quantity how has it led you to redefine or expand perhaps what you see as your participants' data and perhaps even how you define your participants' context. Maybe I'll start again. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of smirked there when you mentioned uh, is virtual ethnography actually ethnography? I mean, this is the kind of conversation that anthropologists always get into. Is something ethnography or is it not ethnography? And then we have to draw a line and we have to make some kind of determination whereby one thing is not ethnography and one thing is. And to an extent, I don't really know if it's a totally helpful conversation because it sort of perpetuates the stereotype of anthropologist splitting hairs. But um, I mean, I guess to to try to answer, I mean, one thing that someone, uh, I kind of got into this conversation regarding like rapid or agile ethnography and is that actually a thing and does that exist? Um, and I think the kind of the big takeaway was if it's a theoretically informed account of people in context, and it's not just like you doing interviews and calling them ethnography and like interviews in like two weeks and calling them ethnography, but that there is like a sort of a rigorous theoretically informed approach with an account that's produced. Then I think you could 
make the case that it is. And I mean, and there's like Sarah Pink, for example, has put out a lot on short-term ethnography and short-term ethnography kind of reminded me what Rodney was talking about, about way at the beginning of the panel with regards to the intensity, even if it isn't for a really long time, but the intensity of the project. So I guess with regards to virtual ethnography, I mean, I think it just depends on how it's being used, how the virtual methods are being used specifically. And if they're done with an ethnographic sort of aim, where it's meant to be a theoretically informed account, then I'd say, yeah, I mean, we can call it virtual ethnography, but I think it's about the intent. I don't really think it's about the method itself. I agree. Oh, go ahead, Rodney. I'll go next. No, I was just going to say I agree with Chris. I mean, I think the only the only build that I would have to that is, I mean, when I when we're working with this network of Gen Z anthropologists that we've sort of upskilled, um, they are not reporting on virtual experience. They're reporting on their actual lived experience, even though they're transmitting the observations virtually. Um, and that's our connection point. But I'm, you know, as with any sort of interlocutor in ethnographic fieldwork, you are appreciating that they are sharing, you know, their stories with you um, and providing you with the opportunity to engage with those stories and witness those stories. And so I think in that extent, I mean, just that in that in that context I, I i don't i don't find also this useful that very useful to determine you know is this, is this is authentic ethnography or not i think it's more about witnessing and developing trust with the folks who are sharing the truths of their experience with you and entrusting you to represent them in a way that is meaningful and may eventually have um positive outcomes for 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 the vote for them yeah, and, and building on what both Rodney and Chris said, I, I, Chris, I'm so glad you pointed out that this is one of those tricky things, like do we even bother to engage in like trying to narrow the definition? I really am of two minds because as, as an academic who taught people about these things, I tend to be a bit old school of, in the sense that like, do I think everything we do to research human behavior is eth ethnography? No. It's not, and, and frankly, you have to be practical when you are in business and you are practicing these methods rather than the luxury of you know, most academic research, basic research that's not you know, in an applied context. You get to do all of the correct things, right? Theoretically, methodologically, you know, all of that, ethically, and when you're in a business context, you have to sometimes take shortcuts. You have to do things to make clients happy. You have to do things to protect your participants, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And I've actually been trying to discourage mm -hmm. our team from throwing the word ethnography around so loosely because I feel like it's been co-opted by people who have no idea what it really is or where it came from. And of course, as a devoted anthropologist, nothing ticks me off more than when you know somebody who has no idea starts talking about ethnography and not linking it back to anthropology or you know the social sciences even for that matter. Um, but on the other hand, and this you know this is something I struggle with. You know people talk about democratizing ethnography and and democratizing research, and I, I am normally very decisive, but I go back and forth because. You know, on the one hand, it makes perfect sense to bring more people into the process. You bring more perspectives. You bring, you know, um, diversity of experience. But on the other hand, like Chris said, if it's not grounded in some common theoretical understanding or, you know, I like to use the anthropological perspective rather than necessarily a theoretical mm -hmm. uh, understanding, like if you're not following some sort of, you know, common ground rules, then no, I don't think we should call it ethnography or anthropology for that matter. It's just an interview, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's I just what want to add on that too. I mean, I remember uh, when I was working with the startup, there was this uh, guy who was uh, consulting with us and uh, they claimed that they did ethnography, but 
it was really, they just ran around an apartment building and took pictures. And this was right after my PhD. So I was extra zealous and um, they showed it to me and it was like, oh, we did participant observation. No, uh, you really just ran like around an apartment building and showed me pictures, one of them with yourself in a stairway. So, I mean, that, that is kind of what is another concern of mine in terms of evangelizing anthropology is you have to be careful to not get commodified. And that's kind of what happens. These methods get diffused, but they, they're not really used with much understanding really what they are that ends up cheaping, cheapening like what we do. Um, but I mean, to get back, back to another point, though, what like Melissa was uh, was making is that I mean, to me, it's fine if you're just doing user interviews. If really you just need to do surveys, then do a survey. It doesn't need to be an ethnographic survey. Do an interview. You don't need to call it an ethnographic interview. Just do the interview. And then if you end up doing something ethnographic, then that's great. But I mean, I I think sometimes there's this pressure among anthropologists to say that everything they're doing is ethnography, but really it's not. But there doesn't need to be that kind of pressure in the first place. I think Tim Angle made this good point. It was like the paper... Um, what enough about ethnography so i think it was called something like that and that's enough about ethnography because at some point it it's really about flexibility it's doing what's the method that's best and being honest about it and if you're doing an interview just do the interview do the project <laughs> so that was just about the point that i wanted to make on that too that if, it, if it's not ethnographic it's okay just just call it what it is yeah, no, thank you so much for that. I think it's uh, it's really great to hear these perspectives. On the one hand, it speaks back to the field where, when there where there was a lot of kind of you know uh, sense of kind of territorialism around what is and what is an ethnography, and uh, a lot of practicing anthropologists push back on that, of course, and say um, it's a you know we don't need to kind of engage in these kinds of turf turf wars. But I also hear you say that perhaps it's also an opportunity to push back on the narrative that any encounter with a person in situ even, which has kind of been the, the way in which ethnography often is framed in, in professional settings, is by and by itself already uh, kind of anthropology, largely speaking. And you no, know, there's an opportunity kind of to reamplify and that uh, the value anthropology brings is um, this possibility of bringing um, context and kind of framing that conversation beyond that specific encounter. So thank you for reamplifying that. Uh, I'm, I'm aware we only have a few minutes. I just want to pick up on a couple of more questions that are coming in here. Um, one question um, from the audience is, um, uh, Bill Roberts is asking, can each of the presenters comment, maybe briefly, or if somebody has a specific comment, uh, comment on whether the pandemic has led to noticeable changes in either the way you or your clients practice leadership um, or management of your team? Or perhaps, you know, I would, I would kind of suggest that we kind of add an anthropological lens there. You know, is there an opportunity to, Rodney, you mentioned that there's been a kind of larger appetite in the organization for anthropological thinking. Melissa, have you kind of seen similar opportunity? Um, you know, I like, uh, Chris, um, Rodney, how you were kind of saying that this moment is an opportunity for your organization where you're really reevaluating a lot of practices and kind of created the space to ask questions. Um, have you seen that gap open in your own spaces as well? Um, and maybe how do we keep that gap? Um, how do we preserve that gap uh, for kind of an inquisitive um, uh, attitude in business rather than, you know, having it closed shut as soon as we return to quote unquote normal? I have something to add, but I'd rather Rodney or Melissa go first. I feel like I'm just going to repeat myself, unfortunately, because, you know, for me, what, what I would be able to contribute to that question is more about how we've been responding to the conditions our researchers are dealing with. And it's been a real struggle because, you know, folks you might have gotten to see in the office at least part of the time and check on them and see how they're doing. Um, you don't see unless you have a formal meeting scheduled to join on Zoom and um, you know, we talked briefly about Zoom fatigue. It's interesting how different organizations are dealing with this because, you know, my husband works for a really large corporation that literally can't handle all of the employees using video. So their mandate is 
only exceptionally ask people to be on video. Otherwise, do not because it's too much for the system to handle. My company is exactly the opposite. It's sort of frowned upon to not be on video. And as a manager, I appreciate that because I want to try and see how are they doing? What's going on? Are they okay over there? You know, but I can see where for for my team, that might be really exhausting after a while because it feels even more performative than when they were in the office, you know? So there's, there's difficulties in that. And I feel like, you know, stuff we were able to sort of not pay attention to before the pandemic, like just assuming everybody's lives were fine. The good news is the company is paying more attention now to, uh-oh, we're hearing from everybody, they're burned out, they're fried. We got to do something about that. But we're struggling, like, what do we do about that? Like, we don't have a lot of solutions. And so, you know, I think, unfortunately, like Chris mentioned earlier, we are looking at, you know, our competitors and, and similar companies to be like, what are they doing? What can we do? Like, we don't already have solutions ready to go. So. Yeah, I'll just, um just very quickly say that um, the ways in which the negative space of experience informs us about um, how, how things are okay, or they're not okay. Um, the, the witnessing of um, somebody's face as they walk through a corridor between meetings and not only in meetings, um, all of those types of um, indicators um, are something that are so, I mean, they're just so valuable to sort of positioning and situating oneself in a context. And I think that that's what we're really craving as an organization. And I, and, and you know, I, when we go back to whatever hybrid flexible model we go to, um, I think people are going to be so surprised by how much and how valuable those are. At the same time, I have had a few work experiences more recently live, and it's incredible how addicted to our screens we are now. Um, how just in that instance of sort of stepping away from the sort of like the central character in a conversation, it is to turn to your screen and dip into it because we're so embedded in this behavior now. So I think that that conditioning um, is going to have to be unlearned a bit. We're going to have to sort of figure out how to drop the screens um, to be witness to the negative space in sort of an office space. So I think that those two things are going to be really interesting to track um, because the screen time is obviously creating a lot of distress, but also the sort of absence of that negative space is contributing to a different type of distress think we're gonna we're gonna be happy to, to to return to a place where those two things are are lessened in importance yes absolutely that's great thank you so much um i think this is actually a really great place to end um and it's a really kind of um hopeful i think you know rodney are uh, adding here this renewed possibility to bear witness um again and be open to kind of more spontaneity and less structured encounters um, is definitely something we all look forward to. At the same time, it really, I really do hope that there, we retain um, this kind of reflexive moment uh, that the pandemic had over, uh, opened up. And it seems like there is, you know, just listening to a lot of your perspectives, there's much more um, kind of um, internally focused reflection that's been going on, um, you know, not exclusively um, kind of researching as far as our participants or our clients, but also rethinking methods, our own work practices. So that's also um, encouraging to see as well. And hopefully these will, um, these conversations will shape more ethical business practices going forward as well. Um, I did have a point there, yeah. just for, for, yeah. <laughs> I did say I did have something to add. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, my, my uh, addition there was just that, um, I think I'm a lot, I'm very concerned about the, as Melissa has been saying about, um, I guess you'd say long-term effects of COVID-19. I think especially some of the trauma that's been experienced, I think regarding, I mean, Zoom fatigue and burnout and um, the isolation, I think that's 
just a lot of that's going to get sorted out. And I think a lot of this stuff is going to get played out, I think, in a very uneven way over the next few months and longer. And so I think the, in a way, um, I think there is an opportunity for anthropology there. I think that there is a window that's appeared in organizations to look at how work is happening and what environments are better. And that's where I think that's where I've been trying to encourage anthropologists to jump in on this um, conversation because there is a window that's there. How long the window is there, I'm not really sure. And I've been viewing it as a window, but I think that the more that we get visibility for how we act in organizations, whether it's workplace or whether it's management consulting or something else, the better we can keep that window open. But I think it's really about, um, in a way, I think it's about public anthropology. And I think that's really how to do it right now. Thank you for adding that, Chris. I'm really glad that you've um, kind of included that perspective, especially as we wrap up. I, I completely agree. It's really important. That's part and parcel of um, this community as well, kind of raising visibility of anthropology in these settings, but also raising the value of anthropology and anthropological, anthropological voice at every kind of um, level of uh, professional engagement. Matt, uh, Bob, do you guys want to, do you have any uh, parting comments that we want to add here before we wrap up? I think it would be great if the, uh, if the panelists looked at the questions and um, if they want to answer any one of them, just type your answers in and we'll find a way to get it out to people. Uh, the other thing is that our next session will be, we hope will be our last virtual session. Uh, after that, we'd like to do really, we're actually thinking that we might do some kind of hybrid where those of us who are in the New York metro area can meet face to face and those of us who are living not in the New York area, um, can uh, either zoom in or somehow participate. Uh, we're planning on our next session in August, and that will feature Jillian Tett, who, will, who has a new book coming out called Anthrovision, which is uh, essentially about the application of anthropology and business, something we're all interested in. It's coming out in June, and she has kindly agreed to talk about that book and answer some questions. So uh, look for that. Uh, we'll be announcing that the date for that shortly. Great. And I would just add real quick. Um, so we said at the beginning, but the video will be up on businessanthro.com. If you're not already signed up at businessanthro.com, please also, you know, we encourage you to do so. Um, but certainly by just visiting the site, you can find the video on there. And um, somewhere on there is also the Clemson. You know, we put something about the Clemson piece up there in the past, but maybe we could put that up again in the near future. So thanks, everyone. Appreciate you attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, panelists.